Okay, welcome everyone to this keynote session on infectious disease forecasting. As usual for a keynote session, we won't be using the chat box. Uh, please put any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Um, during the Q&A session, we'll be able to raise your hand and ask questions, but feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll take them at the end of the talk. Um, the presenter today is Professor Nicholas Reich. Nick is based at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and is one of the top forecasters in the world in epidemiological forecasting. He's been instrumental in bringing methods such as weighted ensembles and probabilistic scoring methods into epidemiology, and he's driven new methodological research in combining and comparing probabilistic forecasts that is applicable well beyond epidemiology. But he's really come into his own in the last 18 months, providing international leadership in forecasting and analysing COVID-19. And his work is closely followed by many national teams working on COVID-19 forecasts in their own countries. I'm on the Australian Government Panel, which provides weekly forecasts to the Australian federal and state governments on COVID-19 cases. And we frequently reference and discuss the parallel effort that Nick is leading in the United States. Um, he established the COVID-19 forecasting hub, which feeds into several other sites tracking COVID-19 data. So it's really timely uh, to have him speak at the International Symposium on Forecasting. I'm delighted to have him here, um, especially at a time when epidemiological forecasting is so important to all of us. So without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Professor Nicholas Reich to speak on the computational science of infectious disease forecasting. Thanks, Nick. Great, thanks Rob for the kind introduction. Thanks to George for the invitation and uh, to everybody at ISF for organizing this great conference under such sort of unusual and, and not ideal circumstances. So um, it's, I attended my first ISF two years ago in Greece and uh, just immediately felt really at home at this conference with its great mix of the, both the practice and theory of forecasting um, and it's really an honor to be giving a keynote talk here today. So uh, here is the outline of my talk. There's sort of five sections of it. I'm going to first give a little bit of background on epidemic forecasting for those of you who aren't as familiar with it. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this, what I'm sort of started referring to as the hub approach in epidemic forecasting and how um, how that's played out over the last year and some of the ways that, um, that, that Rob mentioned in his introduction. We'll talk a little bit about some of the work that we've done in working to build uh, weighted ensembles for COVID-19 and some of the, the trials and tribulations of that. I'm also gonna talk a little bit about some of the work that my group has done trying to think carefully about the infrastructure that it takes to build these sort of coordinated modeling and forecasting efforts. And then finally, close by just talking a little bit about some of the, the um, broader landscape of what I see as the, the full sort of computational science of forecasting. Okay, so uh, here is some background on epidemic forecasting in like five slides. There's of course way more to say than all of this, but, um, but, it's, uh, but it's at least a place to start. I just wanna start by just giving a brief introduction of my group and sort of how we've ended up being uh, at the center of this, um, everything that's going on with forecasting COVID in the US. So I've been based at UMass Amherst in their Department of Biostatistics, Biostatistics and Epidemiology for the last 10 years. And my group has always focused on taking statistical models and applying them in real world, sort of real time operational collaborative relationships with public health agencies that have ranged from the US CDC to the uh, Thai Ministry of Public Health, and also sort of state and local public health agencies around, around the US. Um, because of our close engagement with CDC and their influenza forecasting efforts that have been going on for close to a decade, uh, we were named a, and given a grant to be a uh, national center, a national forecasting center of excellence uh, funded by CDC just, uh, just before, uh, within a, the year before COVID-19 started. So because we were well positioned and had this existing collaboration with CDC, our team was well poised to then sort of launch and lead this COVID-19 forecast hub effort 
which I'll be talking more about in a little bit. I also just want to mention the really instrumental effort that my collaborator, Dr. Evan Ray, has played. He was a postdoc in my group a few years ago and has been a co-leader of this group for the last um, for the last year. So here is sort of if I were to if you, somebody were to say, show, tell me about epidemiological forecasting in a big picture in one slide. This is, I think, the slide I would show. So. Basically, in many ways, uh, epidemiological forecasting is like many other fields. We have a, a time series of data um, that is typically coming out of a public health surveillance system. And, uh, and we're trying to make predictions into the future. Some of the key challenges are that often the preliminary data from that we get out of these public health systems may be incompletely or imperfectly reported, sometimes underreported sometimes overreported because there's you're getting sort of a backfill of cases that are sort of all of a sudden appearing in the system. And so a lot of models focus on what people in epidemiological forecasting, I think this is a, a more widely accepted term called now casting. So trying to sort of adjust these more, more recent observations to sort of what they might eventually end up uh, being reported as. And then uh, the sort of convention in the last 16 months in, in the epidemiological modeling community has been to talk about, to think about short-term forecasts, sort of think about this very narrow window of time when we can really make an unconditional prediction about the near, the, the, the short-term, um, the sort of next like one through four weeks, uh, what's gonna happen. And uh, as we all know, these, you know, as we now, so many people understand, uh, Outbreaks and epidemics are really social phenomenon. They're driven by and large by uh, societal behavior. And so therefore making long-term predictions really requires making long-term predictions of human behavior, which is really, really challenging. So making longer term projections as epidemiological modelers have taken to calling them really um, tend to be uh, much more conditional on specific sets of assumptions. So you can make a longer term projection maybe six, eight, 10, 20 weeks, if you're really brave. Um, and, but those will all will always be conditional on specific assumptions. How good is vaccination coverage? How have new strains emerged and so on and so forth. So what I'm gonna focus on in this talk is really on this narrow window, the sort of thinking of if we're at the current time, how can we project forward just a few time steps, or maybe going one, two, four, maybe six weeks into the future and trying to understand, make an unconditional prediction about what we might see in the next few weeks. So another key feature about epidemiological forecasting, and you have this in, in other fields that, that have, where you consider forecasts as well, is that these forecasts can create a feedback loop, right? Weather forecasts don't impact the weather. You have some immutable, physical system that's going on no matter what our computers are saying. But, uh, but an outbreak forecast could impact an outbreak. And here are just sort of two pictures illustrating this. Here's a, from 2014, after models generated at the CDC showed that, uh, you know, a sort of unmitigated out Ebola out and outbreak in West, in West Africa could lead to a global pandemic. The US military was deployed. And here's uh, a picture on the left um, in 2018 of uh, local, um, vector control. These are essentially people who go out and kill mosquitoes in Thailand after a neighborhood is designated as having a high risk of having a dengue outbreak. So these predictions could really lead to activities being taken place that could then, of course, change the course of the outbreak. So there's this, this is one of the other challenges that makes longer term predictions hard. So I'm gonna sort of describe what I see as like a typical epidemic forecasting setup here. So this is, and this is sort of based on the annual CDC flu site challenges that have been run uh, annually for the last eight years. So uh, this is basically, they have some time series. In this case, it's a measure, a measure of influenza-like activity for every region in the US. And they've, in more recent years, they've also been looking at it at the state level, and they're just trying to make short-term predictions into the future. To their credit, I think CDC has worked really carefully. They've been a leading global public health agency in terms of engaging with, with quantitative modeling modelers and modeling groups and trying to identify really clear 
targets to uh, that have public health relevance and that they can sort of incorporate into decision making, but that also are sort of tractable from a modeling perspective. And so in this example, in these annual competitions, the, the, um, the setup has been that they're looking for one through four week ahead forecasts based on the most recent data. And then also some what they call seasonal targets of sort of when will this trajectory first be above some baseline that's region specific? When will it reach a peak? And when it does hit that peak, what will that peak intensity be? So I'm not gonna spend much time talking about the flu stuff, but it is, I think, a really important backbone of forecasting effort. And I think it's driven a lot of methodological innovation into epidemiological forecasting over the last, over the last decade. So just to sort of talk a little bit about the policy side as well. So see the other thing, so CDC has done really a great job engaging with the modelers and they've also done a great job engaged sort of pushing the messaging and what, as they call it, socializing forecasts sort of up the rungs at CDC. So this is the director of the influenza division speaking a few years ago at a, at a workshop that I attended, um, uh, talking about the different applications that he sees of forecasting. And a lot of it is sort of informing and sort of looking to communicate with different stakeholders, whether it's healthcare providers, schools, businesses, et cetera, about um, you know, possible surges that are coming up. So a lot of our work has focused on probabilistic forecasting. And I, was, I spent some time, I don't know how I found time to read over over the, over the Christmas break, but I did. Um, and I, I was reading this, uh, this memoir from Obama on his first term in office. And I found this really compelling description of, from, a, from obviously a, a sort of consummate decision maker um, about sort of arguing for probabilistic modeling. And uh, I found, you know, there's a lot of text here. I'm not gonna read it all, but I think the key piece is that Here's a decision maker who's saying, I understand that there's never gonna be a 100% clear solution. And I was always dealing, he says, I was constantly dealing with probabilities. And that by, by being able to, by sort of, ha, ha, by expecting probabilistic model outputs, he was able to feel like he could make these best decisions that where he was sort of doing this job of weighing the probabilities that these models were being given to him. So I think this is a nice argument for why probabilities and probabilistic forecasting is important from um, obviously a very, very um, important decision maker. And here's just uh, an example showing, uh, showing how CDC actually communicated these probabilities in a mass media publication, the Washington Post, they're kind of hidden at the top. Um, uh, but basically sort of you, where the CDC was communicating these epidemic forecasts a couple of years ago, uh, as you'd hear a weather forecast, you know, CDC flu forecasters say there's a 30% chance the season will peak around the end of December and a 60% chance that the greatest incidence will be by late January. So I think this is a nice example of sort of putting all this together, having these CDC folks, the staff that we work with at CDC, taking these probabilistic forecasts, messaging them, and communicating them more broadly. So now I'm gonna pivot and talk a little bit about um, what I see as sort of the hub approach in epidemic forecasting and some of the things that make that unique. And then also a little bit um, start to get into some of the details about the COVID-19 forecast hub. So I think one thing sort of more broadly speaking that over the last eight years or so, there've been a lot of government coordinated outbreak forecasting efforts. It's not just flu, there were some for Ebola, chikungunya, Zika, dengue, now COVID-19. And one consistent finding across all these efforts is that combining models into some kind of an ensemble provides more consistent forecasts than any single model. And this is likely not a surprise to the ISF crowd, but um, it's been nice to see this sort of replicated in now many different settings in, in epidemiological forecasting. So more broadly speaking, this idea of a hub is not new, right? The, I think the central idea here is that we're trying to coordinate modeling between groups in a way that can inform policy and ideally develop our scientific knowledge about a system. So I see this as a little bit different than sort of a competition setup. 
in that it's involving coordination between groups, often in real time. That's not to say that we're not measuring accuracy of models and making leaderboards and stuff like this, but, um, uh, but I do think there's a slightly different focus here on sort of informing policy and really making these models operational. So there are a lot of examples of this in many different fields. I've highlighted a couple here, including really what I think is probably the most prominent of them in sort of climate modeling for the IPCC, but there are also many other groups that are sort of doing model, model coordination in fields like ecology, space science, focusing on space weather, and many other, many other fields that I don't list here. So let's pivot and talk a little bit about COVID now. So here we are in early April, 2020, um, and there was so much uncertainty about what was gonna happen and policymakers really needed more than one model. So uh, in early April, the first week of April uh, in 2020, we launched the COVID-19 forecast hub. And uh, basically the goals at that time were to try to create a framework where we could provide decision makers and the general public with reliable information about where the pandemic is headed in the next month. We also wanted to be able to assess reliability of forecasts and gain insight into which modeling approaches do well. And finally, building on the work that CDC has done cultivating this flu site community for a long time, we wanted to build on that and create this community of infectious disease modelers that's really underpinned by a sort of open science ethos. So since then, it's been a long time, uh, about 15 months, I guess. And, uh, and basically every week, the, so the COVID-19 forecast hub has been active since April, 2020. We receive forecasts of weekly incident cases, hospitalizations and deaths in the US due to COVID-19 from dozens of research groups every week. Every week we build an ensemble that combines these quantile based predictive distributions that we receive from teams for a one through four week ahead forecast. And to date, we've curated data from over just over 100 models. We've received over 4,000 submissions and over 57 million unique predictions. And I'll define what I mean by a unique prediction a bit later in the talk. All of this data is open and available, and it's, I've actually been really happy and, um, and proud to see a lot of these data being used in some of the talks on COVID-19 uh, forecasting. So I, it's the, really one of the goals of this is to help create this open data set that people can use to do, to do further research. I'm just going to switch gears for a second and provide a quick demo visualization of our website. So this was updated, it's updated every Tuesday. We didn't quite manage to get it updated in time for my talk this week, but it should be updated a little bit uh, later today. So here is the website showing the um, forecasts of new deaths, new weekly deaths at the US national level. And so you can see here, um, the models are basically predicting mostly a sort of slow and steady downward trend, although there's maybe a little bit of probability that things might go back up in the next couple of weeks. Um, you can navigate back at any point in time and sort of see what the ensemble forecast was saying. And you can also go back and select other models and see what other models were saying at different times. You can really do the full spaghetti and see, see sort of what everything is, everything is saying and you can click around to different states as well. So there's a ton of data just to explore visually here. The website takes a bit of time to load up, but um, but it tends to be well worth the wait. So I encourage you to spend some time exploring that if you have interest. Um, I also realized that I meant to uh, throw some links in the chat here to relevant to the talk and I just threw them in now. Um, all right, back to the talk. So these data that we receive from all these teams are shared directly every week with the CDC and they're published. They're, these become sort of the official forecast of record for the CDC every week. Typically they're released on Wednesday. So just a couple notes about some of the individual models 
that we have in the hub. So there's a wide array of models that are in the hub. Um, some are sort of pure statistical time series model. Here's a model from Carnegie Mellon that is just a basic autoregressive model. Um, there's some deep learning models that incorporate uh, different, different data sources. And there are also um, models that are based on what people refer to as sort of classic compartmental models from epidemiology. These are sort of process-based models that, um, that really think about the interaction between susceptible and infectious individuals in a population. And then there are approaches that sort of combine effective statistical inference with uh, a sort of understanding of the susceptible population. So there's a really a fairly wide range of data sources that are used and modeling approaches that are used. So I want to talk a little bit about how um, uh, how we evaluate these forecasts. So the, the models are submitted, as I mentioned before, in a quantile-based format. And uh, we developed early on this metric called a weighted interval score. And I just need to mention that um, Johannes Bracher, who uh, was a collaborator from the Heidelberg Institute of Technology. He's worked very closely with us from the very beginning and really has led um, our work in sort of developing and thinking about these, these metrics. So um, basically we take the, in, the inner, the metric of, a, of an interval score, which has sort of three components. First is the width of an interval. So it's, you have a, a predictive interval uh, from the, with a lower bound and upper bound, you take the width. So higher intervals are going to give you a higher, uh, wider intervals will give you a higher score. And then there's a penalty if the interval is too high and not covering the truth and a penalty if the interval is too low. So here's a picture showing the, the interval score metric for different, here's your predictive distribution in the green curve. And here are sort of the different possible values of the observed outcome. And this green line is the values that the interval score would give smaller values of the interval score are better. So if you have multiple, pre multiple predictive intervals, which is the case at the forecast hub, we can compute a weighted average of these interval scores. And with a clever choice of weights, we can get this weighted interval score to approximate the CRPS, which of course is a well-known um, well metric in probabilistic forecasting. So a few key features here are that this is a, the weighted interval score is equivalent to the pinball loss. And also that this resulting score is proper, which gives us all kinds of sort of theoretical benefits. Further, we've defined a relative weighted interval score. I'm not going to spend too much time here, but this is a metric that we come back to. The idea basically is that for every pair of models, we compute a pairwise relative weighted interval score that's based on the available overlap of all forecast targets. What we then do is take a geometric mean of all pairwise relative weighted interval score values for every model. So this gets us this theta m. And then this theta m, so you can, you can then think of this theta m as a measure of relative WIS that describes the relative performance of model m adjusted for the difficulty of the forecast model m made. So if model m is only making forecasts for the easy times and locations to make forecasts for, um, it's not sort of rewarded for doing that because it's only compared with other forecasters that have also forecasted for that set of times. And then we take this theta m and we scale it by the theta for a very naive baseline model that essentially just predicts a straight line out um, from the most recently observed data. And so this is what we will refer to as the relative WIS as we go forward in the talk. So it's a measure of the relative WIS against a baseline model. So here are some pictures of some data and some of the scores and a little bit I'll show pictures of some, some more of the forecasts. So here is a, the curve showing the observed weekly deaths in the US as of a few weeks ago. Here are the top five models and their performance and relative weighted interval score and 95% uh, prediction interval coverage. And here is a picture on the bottom of showing for every week that average across all locations of the um, weighted interval score for the ensemble in red, the baseline in green, and then every model in, a, in its own gray line and then the average of all those models in blue. So you can see the ensemble 
is maybe not, it's definitely not the lowest every week, but it's occasionally the lowest and is definitely um, one of the best models in almost every week. So another observation that we've made here is that our that the forecasting, the, the sort of calibration, well, the errors increase as the horizon goes up and the calibration decreases. So what this is showing is same x-axis here over weekly over time. And here what we're looking at is the colors are denoting how far into the future these models are trying to forecast. So we have many models that are forecasting one and four weeks ahead, many fewer that are forecasting eight, 12, 16, and 20 weeks ahead, but some do go that far out. And I think what you can see here is that um, essentially on average, uh, one week ahead forecasts are a bit under, they, their sort of empirical coverage is a bit under what the sort of 95% coverage, which they should be. Um, uh, four week ahead forecasts also are a bit less than the one week, but not that much more. These are, this is an average across all models. So it's not just looking at sort of the top models. Um, and, but that once you get sort of past four weeks, you're basically on average below 50% for, um, for all the models. So it's really hard to make well calibrated forecasts far into the future, which I think is again, sort of not a surprising result. So that's the end of sort of my quick background on the COVID-19 hub. I just wanna say, you know, I'm here as sort of the representative for this very large team that involves people um, at UMass and all across the country and all across the world who have, who have been really key contributors to this. It involves a handful of people at CDC, a handful of people who we sort of call our ensemble advisory committee. Uh, and then of course, all the modeling groups who have made contributions. All right, so I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about the adventures that we've had in ensemble building for COVID-19. And we've published sort of two uh, series of blog posts on this uh, in at the IIF blog, which you can go and sort of read a bit, a bit more detail. Although this is actually showing even a bit of sort of new work that we've done since the most recent post. So one of the things that we've observed is that forecasts have missed the change points. Um, and so on the top here, you can see the, uh, the observations and forecasts for cases in the US and on the bottom for deaths. And uh, these are forecasts for every sort of five weeks or so, just so you can see them really clearly and they're not overlapping. And you can see that at these times when the slope is really changing quite, quite rapidly, uh, the forecasts tend to miss, right? These ensemble forecasts are really tending to just kind of predict forward the trends that they're seeing. And, uh, and you can see that here at the top of the peak where it said the outbreak was gonna continue fairly flat and it went down and here where it was gonna continue uh, the slight upward and it continued fairly high. This is especially pronounced for, um, for case forecasts uh, but it, you also see it to a slightly lesser extent with the forecasts of, of deaths. So a question that we have been, that we ask ourselves like every week is how can we improve this? You know, we, we were sitting here in early December and we knew this was wrong. We knew the ensemble forecast was wrong. We knew it, things were gonna, maybe we weren't quite sure how wrong it was gonna be, but, um, but we knew that this was too low of a forecast. Um, but the question is how can we make this better? So let, I'm going to talk a little bit and some, give you some of the, the gory details on how we build the ensemble. So in a picture, the idea is we have forecasts from a handful of teams. We have these handfuls of predictive intervals, and we're trying to combine those into some ensemble. So teams are required to submit for forecasts of deaths, 23 quantiles, for forecasts of cases, it's only seven quantiles that define a predictive distribution. And um, so you can see here, this, these Q are the values of the, the quantiles. So QM is the quantile from the mth, mo mth model for spatial unit S, time point T, horizon H. And this is the first of those 23 quantiles that it needs to give. And so the goal here is to create some combination of quantiles at a particular quantile level, right? So we're saying, let's just think about the kth quantile level. Maybe that's just the first. And we wanna to try to find some way to combine 
all and all capital M of these quantiles together to create our ensemble version of this quantile. So another way to think about this is uh, with, with this figure. So basically you can think about for a given model represented by a gray curve on here, you can think about all the quantiles as defining a predictive CDF for a particular model. And to create this ensemble, what we're doing is drawing a horizontal line at any quantile level and those are all of those QMs from the, from the previous page are shown down here. And we're trying to come up with some way to combine all of those. So obviously a really simple thing to do would be to take the mean. And this was something that we started out doing and used for the first few months of the hub. But a weakness of that was that outlying observations models that have very heavy tails can really pull that predictive quantile far out of the consensus of what most of the models are saying. So fairly early on, starting about, a, about 11 months ago, we switched to using a median of all quantiles at one of these given levels. And then we have been exploring for over a year now, different ways of creating weighted combinations of these forecasts. And this is what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about now. So the question is, <laughs> how can we define an, a sort of optimal ensemble in real time while all of this is, is going on and what, what's been our process for doing this. So in April, 2020, as I said, we started simple. We said, let's just take an equal weighted mean at every quantile level. And what we found was that this, we were ending up with these situations, as I mentioned before, where these, you have these one outlying forecasts and, and that's really driving our ensemble to not be defensible. And so we felt like this uh, feature of having a robust ensemble, an ensemble that doesn't blow up just because we have one or two models that are going off the rails was a really important and desirable feature for our public health collaborators. We couldn't ask them to defend these ensemble forecasts and have them up on the CDC website because one or two models are failing. So for a while, we were actually manually curating out these models that were that were exploding to our eyes, but that we didn't like the subjectivity of that process. So again, here's this example. We have this one model that's going up and it's sort of pulling that mean out. So if we're thinking about this as we want a method that's robust, that's a really important feature for our, our main uh, collaborators, this equal weighted mean was a failure. And, uh, it, and it wasn't that it failed a lot, it was that it occasionally would have a high cost error. Um, and it was operationally more efficient for us to use this median. So we switched to using the median. But we knew all along, we, we were sort of asking ourselves, shouldn't weighting also, shouldn't some way of weighting these different models be able to also fix this error? So now there's this other dimension of thinking about trained, forecasts where we're weighting different components that are coming in. And so here's a picture from some of our experiments where we have model weights over time estimated for each week's ensemble. So these are optimized to have low weighted interval scores. And every color here represents one model. And this is sort of showing that model's weight in each week as we're sort of estimating this in, in real time from one week to the next. And this is for incident cases where we only started this later and then incident deaths where we were able to start a bit earlier. So it turns out there's a huge number of operational subtleties in this work. So you have to estimate different targets. Should you include all the models or just some way of measuring the top models? Do you have the same weights for all quantiles? Maybe there are some models that do really well at predicting the median and really terrible at predicting the tails. Do you wanna just throw that model out because it doesn't do a good job in the tails? How much model history do you include? Is it important to include, include the full history, how this model has done over all time or just in the last four weeks? And if you do the full history, how do you deal with models that have just joined in recent weeks? Furthermore, how do you deal with models that don't submit for one week because somebody gets sick or goes on vacation? So lots of little operational concerns here that, are, um, <laughs> that, that cause headaches. So, Ultimately, what we found was that weighted medians were still occasionally, sorry, that weighted means were still occasionally not robust. So here's a picture of data. I think this is from Ohio in early part of 2021. And they had one of these 
backfill reporting errors, where all of a sudden a lot of data comes through the system and you have this one outlying observation that it's important that modelers see this and say, this isn't real, I need to remove this or make some adjustment to my model. So this is the median approach where there were some models that blew up, but it didn't, doesn't really impact the median. But here is a trained, a sort of weighted means approach. So you can see the scales are quite different here. We're going up to 20,000 here, only 4,000 over here. And this, this trained model that's weighting other methods uh, based on their recent performance blew up and created a, a sort of unsubmittable forecast. So what this showed to us is that again, even variations on a weighted mean were sort of not enough to solve this robustness problem. And so this left us trying to figure out what to do with this lower right-hand quadrant. Can we come up with some kind of a weighted median approach? And so this is where um, Serena and Evan on our team have spent a lot of time over the last few months trying to, trying to answer this question. So I'm just gonna take a brief detour and talk about what it means to compute a weighted median from quantile forecasts. So again, the situation here is that we're trying to compute some combination, this weighted median from at each of the desired K quantiles. So we might take the, these at four, the, our Kth quantile, we have one through M of these values. So you can imagine here again, drawing this horizontal line and let's say there are five of these values you just align them here on your x-axis. One, two, three, four, five. Here are our five Q Ks. Each model M has an estimated weight that's associated with its predicted quantile. So here is this one. This model has a weight of 25, this one 20, or sorry, 0 0.25, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and so on. So these are the weights associated with each of these predicted quantiles. And then we can also think about this as a, we can arrange these as a cumulative weight. So here is that first model that has weight 25. The second, uh, the second model has weight 20, but cumulatively that's a weight of 45. And by the third model, we're above 50%. And so the weighted median in this simple example is the first value of these quantiles such that the cumulative weights from these models is greater than 0.5. So this value would be chosen here as the weighted median. So we cooked up a couple different variations on a weighted median that we wanted to try here to try to fill in this lower right-hand corner of our little two by two table. First, we could just, we're gonna try a simple median of the best five or 10 individual models. We we're going to look at a weighted median where we just use weights from the weighted mean ensemble because the computationally it's a little bit more straightforward and efficient. But then we also looked at a weighted median where the weights were based on our measure of relative weighted interval score. And so this is done by essentially taking a softmax uh, transformation of the relative weighted interval score for a particular model with all of the softmax is scaled by the single parameter of theta. So to give just a little bit more intuition about what this is doing, the idea here is that if model M is bad, it has a high relative weighted interval score, then it would get a low weight. And if model M is good, then it would get a high weight. And theta controls to some extent how dispersed the weights are. So if theta is zero, all weights are gonna be equal. So this picture here is showing a picture of model weights as a function of theta. And if as theta goes to infinity, all the weight is gonna to go to this top model. And at any point here, you could draw a vertical line and these would sort of define a set of weights that would sum to one. So the ensemble forecast is then the weighted median where you're doing this at each quantile level. And for the estimation of theta, we use a, we've been just been using a simple grid search approach. So here are some results from this experiment. These are sort of hot off the presses just a week ago or so. Um, so uh, basically what this is showing is a box plot of differences of the mean weighted interval score for one of these methods shown here on the x-axis minus the mean weighted interval score for the unweighted median. So if, 
lower negative values here indicate that this method has a lower score or is more accurate than the median and higher, greater than zero scores indicate that it's less accurate than this median approach. And every point here represents an average of this difference across locations for one forecast date and horizon combination. And these are colored by using all the models or the top 10 models or the top five models. And so what we see is that using the top five or 10 models, there appear to be consistent improvements with many of these methods over the median of all models, right? All, all, all these black X's indicate the averages and they tend to be below zero here. Um, the weighted mean approach still shows some of these outliers. So these higher values here indicate that there are times when there are a couple of forecasts that are sort of going off the rails and having high error. Um, and you know, there's and there's some sort of consistent improvement here with this relative weighted interval score, um, weighted median approach. I will say that we haven't performed any formal tests here. We're very open to suggestions of tests that you think we can or should do here. What we've, we just have never quite been able to uh, adequately deal with all the correlation between these observations, between multiple locations, horizons, weeks. There's just a lot of correlation that we don't feel like we can, uh, we don't trust a lot of the formal tests that we've looked at. Okay, so now we're at a point back to our two by two table where we have these things that are not robust, but we have these variations on a weighted median that seem to do better than just a simple median on average and seem to also have this, they seem to be robust and have better average. So I don't think there's necessarily a clear winner between these three variations, but at the moment we have this experimental ensemble that we submit every week and we're using the last uh, this last one, the weights based on the relative weighted interval score, um, these are sort of our operational experimental ensemble that we're submitting every week. So I think the key takeaways here are that um, these non-robust methods occasionally blow up. Uh, these robust methods uh, have better worst case performance. And generally these trained methods tend to have better mean performance and closer to nominal interval coverage rates. All right, I wanna spend just a few minutes talking about optimizing infrastructure for hubs, because this is a place where we've actually spent quite a bit of time in sort of the software development realm of things. So just to say, you know, this sort of this hub model, the hub infrastructure has sort of taken root in epidemiological forecasting over the last year. So we, we started this in April, 2020, and then uh, quickly Johannes and a group that, that he's been working with has branched off and uh, has been running this for the uh, uh, sort of similar hub for Germany and Poland. Um, this branched off officially into a European COVID-19 forecast hub that's been funded by the European CDC. And then in parallel, there's also a scenario modeling hub looking at these longer term projections um, that's being run in the US by collaborators of ours. Um, and all of these hubs are sort of using the core infrastructure that we started with in 2020 and have been developing ever since. So I think it's really important that if we're trying to think about doing coordinated probabilistic forecasting efforts, if we want them to be sustainable and scalable, it's really important to have sort of a standard set of definitions, protocols, and tools. And so we've started to do some work on this. We published uh, a paper on this earlier this year talking about this sort of online database that we've created that we, and we've been using actively for the hub. So the exact semantics aren't what's important in this definition. You might quibble with exactly how, what we're calling things, but I think the concepts here are what's, what's really important. So in, this, in these semantics, we define a prediction as a quantitative statement about some unobserved data. So, um, and each prediction is made up of different prediction elements that are sort of different ways of representing that quantitative information. So an example probabilistic prediction might be samples of the one week ahead confirmed COVID-19 cases in Florida. And here samples are the prediction element. It's the kind of prediction you're getting. You have one week ahead confirmed COVID-19 cases. That's the target that you're trying to predict. And then you have a time series in Florida. And that's sort of the, the unit that you're trying to predict for. 
And then we define a forecast as a collection of these predictions. So you could sort of think of it as a grid where you have lots of units. In, our, in the COVID, case of COVID-19, I think of these as locations, states or counties, countries. And then you have targets, like one week ahead deaths, two week ahead deaths, one week ahead cases, and so on. And in every spot in this grid, you can think of uh, a prediction there's sort of a prediction that may contain multiple different prediction elements. So again, for the forecast hub, every square in this grid for a submitted forecast has points and or quantiles in it. But more generally, this could be a named distribution, like a parametric distribution or um, some other representation of that distribution. So there's a nice forecast structure that falls out of this. So you can really sort of think of this forecast in a, if for our users in sort of a Tibble-like structure where predictions are stored in cells as lists of data. So here, every row corresponds to one prediction and uh, multiple rows correspond to a forecast. So here is a one week ahead case forecast for the US represented in quantile format you have some quantiles and values associated with those quantiles. Here's another one where you maybe have uh, a parametric distribution shown. And so once we've defined a general structure like this, that having good infrastructure can really simplify some of these common tasks that a model coordination center needs to do. So you have your standardized data format, you have sort of an API, maybe teams are submitting this in a, some kind of CSV format, it can be pulled into some central database and stored there and then pulled out by an API to do the common task that you want to do, extract that data, you want to visualize it, you want to evaluate it, maybe you want to combine them. And in the case of the COVID-19 forecast hub, we've built pieces all, we sort of built this whole pipeline. So we have a GitHub repository that stores our data. We have a, this zoltardata.com system where you can go to and browse the data. We have R and Python libraries to pull the data out. And then we have the COVID Hub Utils R package that we can use to help do almost all of these tasks down here. And here's just an example, a sort of snippet of code and, and a graph to show sort of how this makes it simple, right? You Once you install COVID Hub Utils, you load it, you run one line of code to load some forecasts for particular models, for particular targets on particular days. And then with one line of code, you can plot them and get a, a nice, simple, straightforward plot. Okay, so here are just a couple closing, closing remarks. So in the US, there's been this, I think, large achievement that we've gotten this uh, sort of principled ensemble forecast in use by top decision makers. Here's a case where essentially Joe Biden was quoting our forecast um, right at the peak of, of the pandemic and sort of bracing the public for crossing this grim milestone of 500,000 deaths. But on the flip side, I sometimes am overwhelmed at, by the task of trying to disentangle the sort of rigorous scientific knowledge and understanding from all the data that's in the hub. And I think there are sort of two central challenges here. The first is that this cadence of real-time outbreak forecasting can make it really hard to carefully define and control these different modeling scenarios. And then that can sort of make it harder to really learn about which models are doing better in which settings. A second challenge is that is data quality. So data quality in public health and biomedical systems is often quite poor, and especially in these sort of real-time surveillance systems. And what we found, and this is, I would say, more an impression than one that's something that's backed up by actual formal data analysis at the moment, but we feel, I, I feel that model accuracy is often in no small part a function of how well a team deals with some of these data reporting issues. For example, that big spike that we saw in that picture from Ohio early on, or it's essentially how well can they sort of manually or maybe automatically do some now casting. So as we move forward, I think a really key piece for epidemiological forecasting in general is to learn from and learn with some of these other model coordination centers. 
Um, so there are a lot, there are many others that I'm not listing here, but sort of what are the similarities with some of these centers that are doing related model coordination efforts, whether they're explicitly forecasting or not, um, and what can we learn from them and bring to the table? I think some of the key open questions here are one, try and understand what data signals can improve COVID-19 forecasting or outbreak forecasting more generally. I think there's a nice new preprint from our collaborators at the Carnegie Mellon Delphi group um, about, about this that just came out last week. Um, there's a lot of questions here about sort of epidemic and pandemic predictability. And what does it say about model quality or model diversity or outbreak predictability in general that it's really hard to beat a simple median ensemble? I think uh, other questions that I am always thirsty to answer, uh, be sort of eager to answer are, uh, what are the sort of general conclusions that we can take away from the hub data about the accuracy of different model structures or the accuracy at different horizons, et cetera? Okay, last slide. Here are like my five takeaways if you're gonna, if you're, if you're just tuning in or sort of wanna take a snapshot of like, these are the, the five things that I think are most important. So first, I think it's always important to look at multiple models. And this is obviously true, I think, in epidemic forecasting, but I think true in many other fields. We've seen that pandemic forecasting is really hard and models aren't always accurate, especially at these change points. What we've seen is that no model is reliably well calibrated at horizons longer than four weeks ahead. That uh, simple ensemble methods tend to work very well and efficient model coordination Re requires good infrastructure. And that's a really big help to have that on hand. So with many acknowledgements, again, to all these people who have contributed to this, um, uh, I want to thank all of them and thank you for your attention. Happy to take some questions. Thank you, Nick. Um, so we'll move to some questions. Uh, I'll start off with the one that's in the Q&A box from Pierre Pinson, who says, uh, it's, us, it's about the particular quantiles that you use. He says, for the forecast hub, you mentioned that you combine quantile-based probabilistic forecasts for one to four weeks ahead. Does that mean you have agreed with all those teams that provide forecasts on a common standard? For example, which nominal levels of the quantiles are required? Yeah, so that's, that's exactly right. I mean, we basically have a, a strict format that teams have to, um, have to follow. Uh, for most of the targets, it's, um, well, for some of the targets, we require that they submit 23 quantiles. For others, we require that they submit seven. In part, that was a storage saving um, move on our part because we opened up case forecasting uh, to happen at the county level in the US. And there are 3,000 counties, over 3,000 counties. And if you start doing the math, 23 quantiles, 3,000 counties, many steps ahead, many, for, many forecasts for many teams a week, the, the numbers get pretty big pretty quick. So, um, so we do have a common standard that we're sort of required. If you want to be part of the ensemble, you have to submit certain, certain quantiles. And this is all detailed in sort of excruciating detail on what we call the technical readme on, um, on the GitHub page for the hub. Okay, we'll now uh, go to uh, some of the people that have their hands up. Um, Simone Emiliozzi, yep. want to turn your mic on? I've allowed the mic on for Simone. Hey there, Simone, you have a question you'd like to ask? Uh, actually, I, I'm so sorry, but I'm connected with the phone and I did it uh, as a mistake. Sorry so much. Okay. Sorry for this mistake. We have Excuse Tammy me. also having a hand up. Tammy? Tammy Wilson Jackson? Mil Wilma Jackson, sorry. No? Rob okay, Galit, Sounds Galit like, is... looks like Tammy's not there. So we'll go back to the Q&A box and Galich Moyle is asking, have you evaluated the effect of under-reporting or other potential measurement issues on the resulting forecasts? This is such a good question. This is something that keeps us up late at night. <laughs> um, so uh, the answer is, uh, let's see, we have done this for 
influenza forecasting and we detected a pretty clear signal that because this is an issue in all public health surveillance systems that data especially in the sort of first few weeks after the data are first released that they tend to be revised and so we saw a very clear signal in the in our flu work showing that these revisions to data led to um to fairly substantial um uh, uh changes in, in accuracy, sort of decreases in accuracy. So the more something was revised that led to higher, um, uh, lower accuracy. Um, uh, for COVID-19, what we, we've sort of done a sensitivity analysis for this preprint that we've written on the, on the effort. Um, and what we've shown there is that from a relative scoring perspective, there's not a lot of sensitivity to these reporting issues. So that is to say that models tend to be ordered in the same way, whether you, uh, you know, the sort of the relative ranking of the models doesn't change whether you include those outliers or not. Um, but I, I, we haven't explicitly done the analysis that says, you know, how, are these big errors associated, uh, big data reporting issues associated with larger errors. We haven't done that explicitly, but you can just see it in some figures. Uh, there are some weeks that it's, that it's, fairly, um, that it's fairly clear. For okay, uh, Claudio Antonini is asking, aren't policy, policy decisions big contributors to the lack of accuracy in the forecasts? Uh, I, I'll answer that question in just a sec. I just wanted to sort of point to a couple of these places where the sort of average score of all models is quite a bit higher than sort of the trend might suggest for these other models. And I think in large part that's due to, um, to these reporting errors. So you can see a little bit of that just sort of pictorially here. Okay. Um, so I'm guessing that this is sort of saying, uh, are there policy decisions that are sort of driving the changes and that contributing to the lack of accuracy? So um, I guess the way we think about this is that sort of back to that very first slide where we're thinking about these as unconditional forecasts. We want these teams to be submitting forecasts that are truly capturing the full range of possibilities. And I absolutely agree with what I think the intention of the question is sort of saying um, uh, that um, that, you know, for cases, maybe in particular, there may be these sort of change points where that are driven by policy changes, whether it's, you know, an additional lockdown or vaccinations coming online. And that can be really hard to predict because you're predicting decision makers, actions, you're predicting human behavior and so on. So I think it, to me, it's understandable that cases are hard to predict at these moments. Um, that said, we're asking teams to give us unconditional predictions about the future. If, if, and that, if that means trying to incorporate some, uh, you know, some additional uncertainty for the potential for uh, for some new policies coming into place, you know, we, teams should try to include that, recognizing that that is like a very, very difficult thing to do. For predicting deaths, I think it's maybe a little bit less excusable because um, because we for deaths we have a really clear leading indicator, and that's cases and hospitalizations. Um, so uh, we, um, you know. A fairly reasonable predictor for deaths is sort of a lagged case curve by a couple of weeks. And um, so it seems like, you know, maybe especially at this part where cases or deaths are turning up a few weeks after cases turn up, that should be a fairly predictable trend that, uh, that a lot of teams still missed. One of the things that uh, we talk about on the Australian team that I'm on uh, is maybe some of the models in our ensemble work better in the early stages of an outbreak, and then some of the other models work better later. Have you thought about that issue and how would you deal with that? Um, yeah, so this is something that we've, that we've thought about. Um, 
I think one of the challenges that we have with this, with, with thinking about this is sort of how do you know when, when things are changing over? And so this is something we wrote about in, that, in our, the second blog post on the IAF um, blog is that another thing that we saw with trained ensembles is that at peaks, the trained ensembles tend to miss, tend to sort of keep predicting up quite a bit because they're, they've been relying on models that have really helped them predict, you know, in the last couple of weeks, the models that did well are the models that really captured that uptick. And so the question is, how do you, how can you anticipate that change point when you need to go from trusting these models that have been predicting a good upward trend to now switching to predict some models that might be helping predict around the peak or sort of the coming down off the peak. And, and that's sort of a whole other, <laughs> a whole other prediction problem is sort of how are you, how do you know when that, when that dynamic regime of transmission is switching and which models would do better then. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it's a really good question and I, I think it, but it also opens up this other, I think a sort of almost a secondary prediction problem of trying to understand which, uh, which kind of a phase you're in. And that's, and that's a hard problem in and of itself. Okay, um, we've still got questions, but we're out of time. Um, so we might leave it there and I'm sure people can uh, email you or chat with you in some other way afterwards. But thank you very much, Nick, for sharing your insight and experiences in uh, this really interesting area. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.